All right. <laughs> so we must be. Well, uh, I am so glad to see all of you who could be with us today here. And I'm sorry you at home can't see, but we've got a dozen folks here who are joining us this morning as we resume wisdom class in person here inside the Weta Fellowship Hall. Welcome to those who are watching from home. And uh, I, I've been waiting for this day for a long time. <laughs> And I am so glad for it. So um, let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Almighty God, we thank you for this morning. It is good to be together, and we do not take that for granted. Uh, Lord, we've been through a time of uh, difficulty, Lord, in many ways. And but we thank you that you have led us to a path where we are able to be here today. And I thank you, God, for the, the blessings of modern technology, but those who aren't able to be physically with us are able to watch from home, and we pray that you will just continue to do your good work among us today as we continue in your word. And we thank you that you are the God of wisdom, and we seek the wisdom that comes from you now, in Christ's name, amen. All right, I do want to give us a chance to pray together. Uh, that's been one of the big things I've missed, is just having the chance to take prayer requests and see how people are doing. I have two announcements uh, that are related to folks that, that many of you know from this class, uh, both of whom were uh, in the hospital yesterday. I think one was discharged. Um, I'd like us to be in prayer for Al Stones, whose wife Judy has been uh, part of our class for a long time. Al uh, was in the hospital for three days with heart-related issues. He was doing better when I saw him late yesterday morning, and he was scheduled to be discharged in the afternoon, so Lord willing, Al is home today, but we need to continue to pray for God's blessing upon him. I also want us to be in prayer for Betty Noonan. Betty was admitted to the hospital a couple of days ago now, and uh, she is undergoing tests. They're still not exactly sure what's going on and what they need to do in response to that. So, prayers for Betty. Who else should we pray for today? My friend Cheryl, she's um, she come back home to San Maria. She's with hospice, and we don't know how much longer she has. So prayers for the family, comfort for the family. Okay, so your friend Cheryl, and she's coming. She's passing. Oh, she's dying. Yeah, she's in hospice, and I'm not sure how long she has. Oh, okay. So prayers for comfort for the family. All right. We will pray comfort for Cheryl's family. All right. What else do we pray for? Anne Marie Rose wanted to be here, but she's not here anymore. Oh, okay. Prayers for Anne Marie, who's usually with us, but she just wasn't feeling well today. We'll pray for her recovery. Better soon. And anything else? Just pray for the blood tests that I take on Monday that it will, uh, the number, the count will be down. Right. Linda's going in for a blood test on Monday. She had one this week and the numbers weren't where they liked them, so we're going to pray that the numbers are better come Monday. Anything else? All right, let's pray for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we're grateful for this time this morning, and our hearts turn to those who are not with us, but very much with us in our hearts and minds. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that you will be with those who are hospitalized, and uh, we ask that you will be with Al Stones as he uh, prepares to go home and leave the hospital. We pray that you will just be attending uh, to the issues that they found in his heart and that you will do good to him and that you will encourage both him and Judy in this time. And we thank you, Lord, for your peace and your sustaining grace. And we ask this, Lord, for Al. And we would pray that also for Betty, who's not with us, because she's in the hospital. Lord, as she is still getting tests and they're still making determinations as to what's going on and what to do, Lord, uh, many times in the hospital we have more questions than answers. So will you be the God who gives peace 
and patience and enables her to wait, and will you let her know that she is indeed held in the palm of your hand, and that blessing may be upon her in this time. And we pray that you will be with Diane's friend Cheryl, who is dying, Lord. It is a journey that all of us must take at some point. It never seems to be easy, Lord. And Scripture doesn't say it's easy, but it does say that we are not to grieve as those who have no hope. So we pray that you will be the God of all comfort to her family to deal with the real pain and the difficulty of this separation. At the same time, Lord, to bring hope because the gospel is about life after death, about the power of death being broken and your great purpose for us to be fulfilled. For you created us to live with you and to live with you forever. We pray that that hope will be there with and for Cheryl and for those who love her in this time. And we pray for comfort and strength. And we pray a blessing over Diane as she ministers to this family and for all those who are around them. Lord, we pray for Anne Marie who wanted to be here today but just isn't feeling too well. Will you be touching her, Lord, we pray? And will you heal her and quickly restore her to us? And Lord, we also ask that you will be with Linda. Grateful that she's here today, Lord, but pray that you'll be with her as she's going back for another blood test on Monday. And we pray that it will go better than the one this week. We pray that the numbers will be more what the doctors want to see. And we pray that you will just continue to give her your peace. And we thank you, Lord, that your love is greater than all. And because that's true, Lord, we trust all these into your care and pray a blessing over them and over us as we open your word now, praying for the guidance of your spirit and praying that you will create the miracle of growth and spiritual maturity in our lives for your glory. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I, the good thing about being in the Gospel of Mark is most people know where it is. You know, sometimes we're running around those small books in the Old Testament and everybody's like, where, where is that? You know, where, where is it? Especially when we get the minor prophets. But most people mark right after Matthew in the New Testament. We know that. But how many of us know the Gospel of Mark? How many of us really understand uh, what's unique in that Gospel? It is, of course, the shortest of the Gospels. It, it has less bulk than Matthew or Luke or John, uh, and it, it sticks to a, a narrative framework. In uh, the as a, as you all know uh, that in the Gospel of John, that's why we think Jesus' ministry was approximately three years because he talks about three series of Passovers at Jerusalem. But you can put the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in one year, and Mark does that. He has just this one framework of the ministry of Jesus, beginning in Galilee in the first half of the book, and then the regions just above Galilee and around it, and then down to Jerusalem in the second half of the book. Mark is a, a gospel of action. Uh, Jesus is a man of action in the gospel of Mark. Uh, the, the words, uh, I don't know how your translation will, will do this, but it, the words, and immediately, which are, uh, in my translation, you will see again and again and again. That's because in the Greek, kai uthus, that is a, just a refrain throughout Mark's gospel. Things move quickly. Jesus doesn't sit down for long periods of time, like you have the Sermon on the Mount, which lasts three chapters. You don't get those long teachings of Jesus. You get some of Jesus' teaching, and there is even a little in Mark that you don't find in the other gospels. But mainly, it is the story of his ministry. And Mark is all, as all the Gospels are, it is the, about Jesus himself. That he is central to history, that he is central to the plan of God's salvation. And it's also about how Jesus is the one who overturns our expectations. That Jesus is surprising. Now, we believe, uh, scholars believe, because of certain things in Mark, that this gospel was written for Gentiles, possibly uh, in Rome in the decade of the 60s. There's no certainty about that, but we know it wasn't written for Jews 
because several times in Mark's gospel, it stops to explain Jewish customs. And if you're writing to a Jewish audience, you don't need to do that. So he's writing to Gentile Christians, and because the uh, early testimonies in the first two to four centuries of the church, when they talk about Mark's gospel, they always tie it to Peter, saying that Mark wrote down a gospel based on the reminiscences of Peter, and uh, uh, so it's tied to the ministry of Peter and to the teachings that Peter gave. Uh, and we may have here a gospel that comes from the hand of someone we know elsewhere in Scripture. There's no guarantee of that. But there's really only one Mark mentioned in Scripture aside from this gospel, which is attributed to somebody named Mark. And that is the John Mark in the book of Acts, the nephew of Barnabas and the one who was there on the first missionary journey and then wasn't because there was a falling out with Paul and then a wonderful reconciliation later on. And it is many uh, uh, traditions say that, yes, this is the same person who was the author of this gospel. So that by way of background, what I want to do this morning is just to dive in to the beginning of the gospel, to the first 15 verses, which kind of sets the table for everything else that is to come. So let's turn to God's word and... Um, Let's see, let's begin in the first three verses. Who'd like to read those first three verses for us? The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of the one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Okay. Now... This looks, like, uh, this looks like what it is, the introduction to the gospel, but at the same time, there are some things that I want to point out to us as we go through here. We're used to, on the other side of this, because, you know, these books were written 2,000 years ago, and we look back on this, and so we see gospel as a certain type of literature, that, that it is the story of Jesus. But that's not what the, the word gospel means. The word gospel simply means good news. It doesn't really describe a book. It describes good news. Now, if you go into secular Greek authors and even uh, the, the intertestamental uh, Greek uh, translations of Jewish documents, good news is often used in reporting the positive results from battle. Victory in battle is considered gospel. Good news, worth telling about, important for people to know. And so here in Mark, when Mark says, when we hear the beginning of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, uh, we're not saying that this is a certain kind of book. We're saying this is good news. And I thought it was interesting that your translation said about, because it, it, it literally says of here in the Greek, and the gospel is Jesus, as we will see here. The good news is Jesus, who he is, what he does, and what God does for us in him. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Son of God is a title that we'll come to again and again in Mark's gospel. It tells us who Jesus is. Now, we look at this, I always think it's important when we read the scriptures to go back and think about those who first heard them and first read them. We read this thing, okay, well, we think, okay, Jesus, God's Son, and we have a fully developed doctrine of the Trinity, etc., etc. But the people who originally heard this didn't have all those, all that teaching. So they're going to learn as they read this what that means, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God's Son. And so that's something that will be revealed as we go through the book. Now, I've told you before that the ancient Greek manuscripts, the oldest ones we have, have no punctuation. And they're all in capital letters. And so part of the art of Bible translation is deciding where do you put the periods and the commas and, and everything else. And there's two different ways that you can read these opening verses. You can say, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, full stop. Or you can read the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and put a colon there. 
because that way it deliberately leads straight in to the prophecy that follows here. Now, Mark says it's written in Isaiah the prophet. Actually, we have a series of quotations here, one from Exodus and uh, um, one from uh, Psalms, and then the last one, the longest, from Isaiah himself. But because Isaiah is the longest quotation, it, the whole thing here is spoken of as coming in Isaiah the prophet. And it is this prophecy that God is going to send a messenger who will prepare the way. Prepare the way for the Lord. And then this quote from Isaiah chapter 40. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. It tells us that the beginning of Jesus is not wherever the story begins. In his actual life here among us. The beginning of the story of Jesus goes back hundreds of years before he was born. Because God has been planning to do what he's going to do in Jesus for a long time. And of course, other scriptures go back and say, from, become, from before the beginning of the world. From way, way back. And of course, you see that in, um, in, the other, uh, in Matthew and Luke where they have genealogies of Jesus that go far back in Israel's history. And then John outdoes all of them. And he says, no, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and He was with God, and nothing was made without Him. So the beginning of the story of Jesus is always before the physical presence of Jesus with us on earth. But also here for Mark, the story, the beginning of the good news of Jesus begins back in the prophecy here. And so it ties the Old Testament to the New Testament which is always important for us to remember. It's so easy to just stick in the New Testament and lose the whole Old Testament picture, but you cannot fully understand the New Testament. Now, as we go through Mark's Gospel, you'll see that it's really interesting he starts with an Old Testament quote because there aren't many. Mark's Gospel has very, very few Old Testament quotes, which really sets it apart from Matthew, who can't get through a chapter or a story without saying, as it is written, you know, and, then, and give these long quotations. Mark doesn't do that. But he wants to make that point straight off, even though he's not going to quote the Old Testament a lot. And why, why is Mark not going to quote the Old Testament a lot? There's a reason. Pardon me? That's right. Because he's not writing, he's not writing to Jews who are familiar with that. They don't have the background and the context to understand all those things. It's not like Matthew, who's writing to a primarily Jewish Christian audience and, and talks about how important it is that the scripture be fulfilled. But Mark still wants to make that point. What happens here is tied to what went before. And it's all part of God's plan. That God has sent this word, that a messenger would come and prepare the way. Now, Look at what it says in Isaiah, because this is going to be one of the revelations that Mark has for those who read his, the gospel here and understand the gospel as given through Mark. The visitation that is predicted in Isaiah is not a visitation of God's Son, is it? It is rather the visitation of the Lord himself. And we will see how that is revealed also as we go through Mark's gospel. And of course, this is why the church eventually came up with what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. is because Jesus is God's son, but he is also Emmanuel, God with us in a real sense, in a true sense. And so trying to grapple with those differing realities. But John, uh, Mark rather here, opens the door and says, yes, Here's the story of God's Son, and it begins in this prediction that the Lord is going to visit. So make every path straight. Now, uh, the background of that, as I, as you, I think you've heard me tell before, is in the ancient world, if uh, great and powerful rulers were going to travel to the provinces and to the, the more rural areas from where they lived, they would have an advance team, and the advance team would go and literally straighten the roads. I, I've told you before in here that uh, Queen Elizabeth has remarked on many occasions, they've asked her, you know, what, what, what do you remember from all your travels? And she said, well, what I, what I always remember is the wet paint. 
the smell of wet paint, because wherever she goes, they paint before the queen shows up, and so every room she stays in smells like it just got painted, because it just got painted. They're making, now, that's what they do for Queen Elizabeth. In the ancient world, they did a lot more than that. They didn't just paint the room you're gonna stay in. In some cases, they literally straighten the road to make the journey quicker and more comfortable. Take the bumps out and the curves out and whatnot and make the path straight. So that idea of making the path straight is going to be illustrated now, not in terms of um, construction, but rather in terms of repentance, as we'll see in the next few verses. Who will read verses 4 through 8 for us today? Do you feel like doing reading? Maxine, <laughs> thank you. that you cannot start the story of Jesus' ministry without John the Baptist. He is, he is the one who goes before. He's part of the fulfillment of the plan of God. John comes first to prepare the way. And, and how does he do that? Well, let's see here. He appeared in the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is very important because the wilderness, time and time again, is where God meets his people and God tests his people. And uh, their, their time of wandering in the wilderness, as, as the nation of Israel, where others go out into the wilderness to, to seek God in other stories in the Old Testament, it is a place where all the, the modern comforts, whatever they were of that time, are stripped away, and people are brought face to face with God and into a greater understanding of their absolute dependence Upon God, So it's no accident that John is out in the wilderness. But it does tell us something that's going to be important in Mark's gospel, which is that God is not at work in the established religious structures of that time. Because all those are located where? In, in, in Jerusalem. Yeah, they're all, they're all in Jerusalem. The temple and all the, the priests, and you know, that, that's the big place. And yet, Jesus is going to be wary of Jerusalem, and he's going to have trouble with the religious leaders. And so what Mark is telling us, the way he structures his gospel is, you know, when God is at work, it's not happening in Jerusalem. It's happening out in the wilderness through someone named John. Now, he doesn't tell us anything about John. We don't know any of the, it's not like Luke where we get the stories of who he was and whatnot. We just have him as John the Baptist. I like to call him John the Baptizer because that's an equally good translation. And it doesn't mean that was his denomination, which is often how we hear John the Methodist. You know, now that's, not, that's not who this is. This is John the Baptizer because baptizing is what he does. Now what is significant about that is uh, John is different from the, uh, again, the prevailing uh, religious leadership of his time, they believe baptism is for people who are converts from other faiths to Judaism. They believe in proselyte baptism. But they don't believe in what, what John is talking about here. John says everybody needs to be baptized in preparation for the Lord's visit. Everyone needs to be baptized as a sign of repentance. He preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, John says the big issue that everybody has is the issue of sin, and that has got to be dealt with. And it doesn't get dealt with 
Uh, now it's interesting, what was the way that sin was dealt with in, in the culture of this time, in typical Jewish culture? That's right, through the sacrificial system. But John doesn't say anything about the sacrificial system. He's, he's, not, he's not talking about that at all. He says, no, the problem with sin needs to be dealt with not through the current sacrificial system, which, of course, as we get through the gospel, we'll see is about to be superseded in what Jesus does in his final sacrifice at the end of this gospel, but also that, um, that the issue of sin is an issue deep within us, and it must be addressed consciously, not just after the fact not just, oh, I sinned, so I have to do this, but rather, our lives need to be reoriented completely. Repentance means a radical change, a conscious change, a change of direction, a change of lifestyle, a change of mind, all kinds of things. And that's what John is calling for here. He says, you, you need to repent Forgiveness of sins isn't just about what you've done, but about how you're going to live now. Do you, do you think that's okay what you've done? Or do you say, no, I realize that I, this is not pleasing to God. I want to live a more God-pleasing, God-oriented, God-seeking life. That's what John is calling for. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So the good news is what here? See, John does have good news because John's good news is what? Forgiveness of sins is possible. That's good news. We all need to know that. And John says, yes, there is forgiveness of sins, but you're not going to find it in the usual channels. You find it when you change, when you turn toward God. When that happens, then you, know, you have this, 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 this moment of forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. Now, here's the sign, isn't it? The people of Jerusalem, they live where all the big stuff happens. But it's not happening there. They're leaving Jerusalem, like everybody's leaving California now. They're leaving Jerusalem, and they're going out to the wilderness, because that's where God is at work in this unique person whom God has sent here in John the Baptizer, they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, now, what else does that tell us? It also tells us that none of us is right with God by virtue of our birth. Because the Jews believed what? Well, you know, we're, we're the covenant people, and so we were born good with God. And John says, no. And this is the radical thing about his baptism. No, 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 all you people, all you covenant people, you all need to be baptized too. You all have a sin problem too. You all need to repent also. And so this is his, his great difference between John and the religious leadership. They're like, we're fine, we don't need this. And John says, absolutely you do. You need to. So everyone needs to be baptized as a symbol of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So all these people are streaming out to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. And they're confessing their sins. And then we get one of the few uh, rare, rare things here. We get a fashion statement and a diet statement. How many people in Scripture is get that? I think John's the only one who gets both. You do get to hear what a few people wear in Scripture, but it's not really important. And you do get to hear what a few people eat in Scripture, and that's frankly more important in that world in terms of the food laws and whatnot. But here is, what's this? Why do we get a description of what John wore and what he ate? We don't get this of Jesus. It's to help us understand who he is. Now, again, Mark... Uh, does not explain to his audience here, but those who do have an understanding of the Old Testament would be able to see that, first of all, let's talk about the fashion statement. Clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. If you go back to the book of 2 Kings, and uh, this is uh, when Ahaziah is king of Israel, uh, he, he's ill, so he sent messengers and he said, Go and find out if I'm going to recover from this sickness. But he doesn't ask them. By this time, Israel's really on the downward slope. 
They've turned away from God, as I think you know, in the time of the divided kingdom, after Judah and Israel split and fractured after the Civil War. All the kings of Israel were bad after that. They didn't have one good king whose heart was for the Lord. And Ahaziah is, is one of those. He's actually the, the son of Ahab, who was one of the worst kings in Israel's history. So he says, <clears throat> I want to find out. But he doesn't say, go ask God. He says, go inquire of Baals above the God of Ekron. Go talk to the Philistines' God and see what's going on. Well, as his minions go and, and do that, well... <laughs> Instead, uh, as, as they head out to talk to the Philistines' God, uh, God taps the prophet Elijah on the shoulder, and he says, Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? In other words, what are you doing? What are you doing? You have forgotten your God. So now, therefore, thus says the Lord, You shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall die. Go tell the king this. And so they go back and they tell the king this. Of course, it's not what he wants to hear at all. And he's like, who told you that? Who told you that? And they said to him, well, <clears throat> this man came up and said this and that. He said, no, no. He said, verse 7, the Second Kings 1. He said, and what kind of man was he who came up to you and spoke these words? What did he look like? And they respond in verse 8. They answered him. He was a hairy man with a leather girdle round about his loins. And the king said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. You see, that was not typical dress in that time. That was a strange way to dress, and it was unique to Elijah. And so now here is John dressing the same way because he is, in this sense, as prophesied in Malachi, which, by the way, is one of... Uh, the books quoted above in that, in that quotation, um, that Elijah will come before the day of the Lord. And so here is John, the new Elijah. But he's dressing just like the old one. And not just that, but he's out there doing what? He's uh, the, the diet thing here, locusts and wild honey. Now those are both okay to eat under the food laws, but most people did not eat locusts for the same reason people don't eat them today. You know, ugh! You know, why eat locusts when you can have, you know, sheep or, you know, whatever? You, you, but, but locusts, believe it or not, are high in protein. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and John is not about indulging himself on any level. And so this is what he ate. This was his regular diet and wild honey. So that's why we get this description about him. He was peculiar, but he was a prophet. He was a prophet. And there had been no prophet in Israel for 400 years, for four centuries. And now this dramatic figure of John. And, people, and that's one of the reasons, you see, this is one of the reasons people went out and traveled even more than 100 miles to see him out in the wilderness, is because word got out. And when people start saying, this is what he's saying, and people say, boy, that's really radical. And this is what he looks like. Ding, 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 ding. It's like, oh, you know, so, so maybe God is speaking again to us. And uh, here, here's a prophet. And so they go out to see John. And he's preaching. And he's saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, and I am not even fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. So as, as great as John is, and here he is, the great celebrity, and he's the person whom God is working through, he's, he's not the great one. He is secondary, in a sense, and deliberately puts himself in that secondary place. He said, there's someone coming after me who's mightier than I. In other words, I'm not the last word here from God. There's someone coming after me, and I'm not even fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I, I just baptize you with water, or in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There are several references in these first um, 15 verses to the Holy Spirit in Mark's Gospel. And then, there's only three in all the rest of the Gospel. So it's significant when he talks about the Holy Spirit. But it's important because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is promised in the Old Testament. But who is the one who can give the Spirit of God? Only God himself. Only God himself can give the Spirit. 
So, so here's another tip. When John, here's another clue when John says, hey, well, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Well, only God can do that. And of course, that's the point. Because John has come to prepare the way for the Lord who is going to visit his people. So the promise of what's ahead and what's to come. All right, uh, verses 9 through 11. Who will read those for us? And, go, and as always, just stop me if you want to ask a question. So, Kim, thank you. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you, I am Okay. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And he's probably about 30 years old at this time. But again, the Gospels don't tell us a lot about Jesus' life before that because this is what's significant. This is where he stepped into the spotlight, if you will, and took upon him the mantle of the mission that he had been sent for. And this is the first part, is he identifies himself with the people. Now, you know that Jesus, uh, we know this because we know the rest of the story and we've read the Bible, so but Jesus is the only perfect, he's sinless. What does he need to be baptized for? And in the other Gospels, in the longer accounts, in one of them, John's saying, what are you doing here? You know, you don't need to be, I, I need to be baptized by you. Mark does not go into any of that, but he shows Jesus what? Standing with the people. Standing with the sinners. And that is what Jesus is going to do throughout the Gospel of Mark. He will stand with sinners. Not as one of them, but he will stand with them and identify with them and seek to minister to them and meet them where they are. And so here he is. And he's baptized by John. And as he comes up out of the water, uh, what translation do you have, Kim? I love that translation of this NLV. verse. The New Luke? Okay. That, that's the no, NIV? Okay, good. Uh, that's, that's excellent, and many English translations um, fail, fail to read this uh, uh, because uh, the King James and a lot of others who followed it said the heavens were opened. That is not the Greek word here. All right? They were torn apart. They were ripped. Skidzi is the word from which we get schism for, for a great tear is, is the Greek word here. It's a very rare word. It's not used very often. And in Mark's gospel, it's only used twice. Once here, as Jesus comes up out of the water, and the heavens are torn apart. And where do you think the other one is? What? It's at, what, when Jesus dies on the cross, what happens in the temple? That's right. And that's the other place where it's used. When at the end of Jesus' ministry, as he dies on the cross, and the temple in the curtain is ripped apart from top to bottom. And what happens in both those places? See, Mark is saying the same thing. What has happened? Um, I, one of the commentators I read, I love this. You know, we, we all know, um, you know, people use the phrase in our culture, all hell broke loose, you know, for everything. But here, all heaven breaks loose here and at the end it, and it, this, this is Jesus ministry heaven is breaking in to earth and as someone else said it, you need to translate it torn apart because if it's things that are open can be closed but things that are torn apart are far harder to close up <laughs> and, uh, so Jesus is again heaven is breaking into earth here the heavens are torn apart and they shine down upon Jesus, and something is happening here beyond just what, what appears to be happening. So uh, he, the heavens are torn apart, and the spirit, like a dove, is descending upon him. Now, this tells us what? That, that the spirit of God is resting upon him, is, uh, is with him. And it's interesting, um, we don't, the spirit is, is mentioned as a dove very rarely in Scripture, but it's kind of become the symbol because it's used in the New Testament here at Jesus' baptism. It becomes 
one of the great symbols of the Christian church. And when you see the dove, it's usually a sign of the spirit. By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll take, a, a, I'll take a, a, a quick side trip here because this, this is a story I love to tell. The sanctuary is, you know, I love the sanctuary. It's beautiful. There's that beautiful cross in the sanctuary, that enormous cross at the front. And then if you look at the, right in the center of the cross, there's what? There's a dove. That's right. And so uh, there was a, a man in our congregation, a wonderful man named Al Mann, and he made that cross. And, and he did. So, so one day I said, Al, I, said, I just think that is so profound. That, you know, here is the cross, and then you've got a dove, you know, in the middle of the cross, how the Spirit reveals who Jesus is. And he looked at me, he smiled, and said, well, he said, actually, I nicked the wood there. And I thought, how can I cover that up? <laughs> I just laughed. I thought, well, you know, God is able, you know. I mean, it, it communicates some very powerful truth to me, even though it's how do I cover up the nick in the wood. <laughs> and, uh, but, it's, but it's a great thing, because it is the Holy Spirit, of course, who reveals who Jesus is to us, and who helps us understand what he has done for us. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he, he made that in his workshop up and then brought it down on a flatbed. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, oh my gosh. Uh, so, again, so here's the Spirit descending upon Jesus. And then the voice comes out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased, or with you I am well pleased. Now this is a, is a very important uh, statement. Who is called God's son in the Old Testament? Not the patriarchs. Not Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Abraham's called the friend of God. He's never called God's son. David. The, the prophet. Hmm? Is it David? Yeah. Okay. yeah the, and David's called the friend of God. He's called the man after God's own. Uh, Abraham's called the friend of God. David's called the man after God's own heart. Um, and you have people who are given these titles throughout the Old Testament. But there's only two, uh, two, two places where a person is referred to as God's son. Two, two uh, categories of that. I want to tell you what they are. The first is in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. This is when Moses is contending with Pharaoh to get the people out of Egypt. And you know, they're having this series of confrontations. And this is one of the times... When Moses comes and says, you know, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I won't let them go. So God says, then you, thus you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. The nation of Israel is called God's son in here. Now, why is that important? Because the nation of Israel is to be the people of God. They are given a covenant. Uh, aside from all the peoples of the earth, this one is given the covenant. The law told how to live. But what happens? Does Israel keep the covenant? No, they don't, which is why they're kicked out of the promised land, because that's exactly what God tells Moses that's going to happen. If they don't follow the covenant, they'll lose the land. That's the sign of my blessing and the sign of my promise, which they do. The captivities to Assyria and to Babylonia. Uh, so, so, and, and why? Because they did not keep the law. They did not observe the law. They did not obey the law. But there is going to be one who shows perfect obedience to God. The only one who will ever show perfect obedience to God. And it is, of course, Jesus. And so when God says, this is my son... It's not just, he's not just making a, an, what I'll call an ontological statement that we are related in this way, but he's talking about Jesus as the fulfillment of all that Israel was meant to be. He is the one who will do his Father's will completely, fully, uh, and, and without, uh, without compromise all the way down the line. Then there's one more 
who's called God's son in the Old Testament. And you'll find it in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. But let me read you the beginning here. This is Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And they say, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords. So let's throw off the yoke of God and of his anointed. But the Lord scoffs at them and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, God says, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The king of Israel. This is, called, this, this is a psalm that was read at the enthronement of every king of Israel. Uh, and that, that's its background. And it talks about the reign of the Lord's anointed. And yet all the kings of Israel, despite their anointing, which of them ruled perfectly? Not one. Not even David. Not even David. And yet, here is the perfect one. The true king of Israel is now coming. The true anointed of God. Anointed not just with oil, but rather with the spirit of God, who now rests upon him, is going to come. So, so in this way, all these images out of the Old Testament are being pulled forward. And they're about to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus himself. And so here, here's the great affirmation. You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Now, what a great beginning, right? Wow! You know, he, here he is, and he's anointed with the Spirit, and it's great, and you might think he'd just run out and start healing people and gathering followers and having all this people. That's not how it works. And again, all what happens right after Jesus' baptism? And not just here, but in other Gospels as well. The temptation. The first thing that Jesus, as the obedient one, as the anointed one, as the king, has to do is he has to meet the enemy head on. We'll read verses 12 through 12 and 13. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Okay. This is all we get in Mark's Gospel. We don't get this long dialogue between Satan and Jesus, as we get between the tempter and Jesus, as we get in Matthew and Luke's Gospel. This is it. But but Mark knows this is this is critical. Jesus doesn't immediately jump out of the city and say, here I am, everybody worship me. Instead, he goes out into the wilderness, impelled, or I should rather say, I would say compelled by the Spirit, sent by the Spirit into the wilderness. And why is he there? Because he has to be tempted there. He's in the wilderness 40 days. Now, we know that... 40 is a very significant number, 40 days, 40 nights, the flood. We also have 40 years, of course, of wandering in the wilderness. It indicates a long period of time and a critical period where God is doing something. In this 40-day period, Jesus is being tempted by Satan. And it doesn't say what any of those looked like or what they were. It just said this was going on the whole time. And not just that. Not just that he was tempted by Satan, but there, Mark has something here that's not in any of the other Gospels. It also says what? He's with the wild animals. He's with wild animals. What's that about? What, why, why is that here? It's, I think, to show us that it's a dangerous place. And anybody who's been out in the wilderness knows that. Uh, the, the wilderness can be a very dangerous place. If you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the national parks, and uh, I, I love to go to them. And, um, but, but if you get off the main paths, uh, you can get in trouble pretty quickly. <laughs> and, uh, and many people do. And uh, 
Uh, which is why, of course, the national parks are national parks, because you can't sue the government, and it's on you. Did you know that? Yeah, you're out of luck if you get injured in a national park. You can't sue the government. You know, so, uh, so, but that was, I remember one thing, uh, I was up at, uh, oh, what's it called? It's the lake that's just south of uh, Yellowstone, and you go down to the, the next to the Tetons, and the June, not, I forget what lake it is, but the, the big lake down there in the Tetons, and uh, I thought, boy, this is just amazing, because usually, you know, everywhere you go, everything's so safety conscious, and you have, you know, big rails and things to hold on to. For goodness sake, we're walking up this mountain, and they, they've dynamited out kind of a half circle, you know? And there's nothing here but just a sheer drop down, and you're walking along here across these rocks. It's not even a path, and you're walking like, it's like, oh my gosh. You know? And they have signs up saying, you know, watch your step. <laughs> but that's it, you know? And I, and I remember saying to Jeannie at the time, because we had our girls with us. This is when they were much younger, and um, I said, this is a really dangerous place. But that's when I got to talk to them, and someone said, well, yeah, but, you know, if you, it's up to you when you're in the National Park. They don't have to worry about that because they can't be sued. <laughs> oh, very interesting. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, the wilderness can be a dangerous place. It can be. And it's full of wild animals. And Jesus was what? He was subjected to not just a spiritual challenge, but also what a physical challenge. The, the challenge of being that because what? How do most people react to wild animals? They get scared. Absolutely. You know, if you've ever come, think, uh, uh, there's a story. My, my great-grandfather told this story. He was born in 1889. And around the turn of the century, you know, uh, California's changed so much over the years. But he was born up in the Bay Area, just north of San Francisco. And in a, in a, in a rural area that's now called Marin City, but it was just farms then. And so he's walking down the... the uh, and he said he's going to pick berries. So he's picking berries and whatnot. And then on the other side, he hears picking berries too. Yeah. As he's going down. And he goes, oh, this is great. So, you know, he's walking down there picking berries. He figures somebody else. They, they, get to, they get to the end, and they walk out here, and it's a bear. Oh. You know, and he's face to face with a bear. <laughs> and, uh, he said, I don't know who was more scared, me or the bear, but we both went. <laughs> and so, so again, but it. Fear, it, you know, we tend to be afraid. And so why, why would Jesus have to face that? I'll tell you why. Because what does Hebrews say? He what? He had to be made like us and be tempted in every way, just as we are. Jesus had to face the temptation of fear, just as we did. Now, he did not give in to that. It's one of the many, many tests he passed. That's why I, I want us to, when we think of Jesus, the thing that amazes me, it wasn't just, well, Jesus got tempted here and that was it. I mean, even, uh, the, I can't remember if it's Luke or Matthew that says that at the end of this temptation, the, the, the devil left him until a more opportune time. You know, it wasn't like this was it, but this was the, 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 the iron, you know, smelting force, the force where, they're, where they're, you know, purifying him and preparing him for what has to be. And so he has to face spiritual temptations. He has to face physical temptations. He has to face all these things. And he did. And he did. And in the midst of it, angels ministered to him. He was not alone. And of course, this is the testimony of Scripture. And we don't understand this. But angels are the messengers whom God sends to do his bidding. And you can find... <coughs> um, and many stories in the Old Testament of what? Of people who are visited by or met by angels and in some cases protected by angels. I can't remember if it's Elijah or Elisha, but there's that, that great story of they're sitting there and here comes this opposing army up to them and, and they're like, and, and the, the guy who's with the prophet says, oh, we're in big trouble. And Elisha says, oh no. And he, and he opens his eyes and they are surrounded you know, by thousands of angels, by an even larger army. It's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, so, so Jesus experienced that as well, that sense of help. And so again, this is what was going on in that period of time. Now that's, that's all we're told. But right after his baptism, right when he, he's told how well-pleasing he is to God and whatnot, 
he has to do what? He has to do something difficult. You know, we think what? And I, that, I think that causes us to, to have to reckon with some things. Because what? We think, well, well, if I'm pleasing to God, then that means everything's going to go great. And everything's going to be fine. It doesn't follow. Jesus is pleasing to God. And he's sent out of the wilderness for 40 days to battle the evil one and be among wild animals. You know, that, why? Because there's something he has to learn there. Something he has to teach. Now, I, I don't know, you know, and you can't walk in anyone else's shoes. But in my own life, when things have happened that I didn't expect, didn't want, and didn't understand, I, I, have, I have learned not to assume that what did I do wrong that this happened to me. That's one of the most important lessons we can learn. Because we tend to think, I must have done something. And, and frankly, there's a lot of people around you who say, oh, you must have done something wrong for this to happen. Read the book of Job, right? And you never can play God and do that. But rather I ask myself, or I ask God, I turn that into an opportunity, Lord, what do you want me to learn in the midst of this? You know, I don't understand it. I don't know for what purpose this has come into my life. What do you want me to learn in the midst of this experience? Because I see here so clearly in Scripture Again, in, in the life of Jesus himself. He is pleasing to God. It's all good. But then he gets marched right out in the wilderness immediately for this. It's all part of what he needed to do. And sometimes it's what we, God calls us to do as well. In a very different way. On a much smaller scale. Alright. So, now. Now that he has received his baptism. And received the affirmation of his father. Now that he's gone out in the wilderness and been tested there and uh, um, proved, been, been approved. Uh, this Sunday, I'm going to be preaching, uh, for, it's Father's Day, I'm going to be preaching from Proverbs. I'm taking a one-week break from, from our usual book study at the moment. Uh, we're not going to be in the Sermon on the Mount, but in, in Proverbs, um, talking about a father's counsel to his son um, and about the importance of wisdom, acquiring wisdom in life, and what's, what's a true legacy. But at the end of that, I, I had to select a hymn at the end, you know, we had to sing that little piece on the way out, because we're going back to the, the heritage format and the heritage service. So I thought, what can I do? So I, I chose the third verse of Trust and Obey, which goes like this. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. And this is the thing. At, at the end of the sermon, I'm giving the sermon away, but come in here at any rate. <laughs> because at the end, the point is what? Here's what you should do, but do it. Knowing the right thing to do is not the same thing as living according to it. And that's where the blessing comes. Jesus said, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. You're not blessed in knowing them. You're blessed if you do them. And so that sense that we must follow through and, and do what the Father says his son should do, to hang on to the commandments, to keep them, to do, to do this and these things. This is what it means to do. And so in that hymn, and I, this is why I love so many of the old hymns, you know, we never can prove, we're not, we're not proving, you know, we never can be approved, is what that word means. To prove is to, to show that it is, uh, that it is so, we, we show ourselves approved. We never can prove the delights of his love because we don't, we don't need to, but we need to what? We want to experience that. And that's what the hymn is saying. We will not experience the delights of his love until what? Until we're all in completely. Until we lay everything on the altar. There's no half-baked following of God. It's an all-or-nothing deal. And scripture, Scripture's real clear about that, and Jesus was very clear about it. We can never experience the full delight of God's love for us unless we are wholly committed to him because the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. And, uh, and that's true. And so now that Jesus has proved that, has experienced that in his own life, now he's ready for what he's been called to do. And so the last two verses here set the table for everything else that is to come in these next chapters. They're the transition between the beginning and between the, the first great section of the gospel, his ministry in Galilee. 
Who will read verses 14 and 15? It's interesting, um, John has the first place, he's presented first before Jesus, and yet he puts himself in a subsidiary role, and then he, he disappears quickly in Mark's gospel. Mark telescopes things here, because we know that John continued to minister concurrently with Jesus, not together, but, but at the same time frame, for a while before he was put in prison. Remember what he was put in prison for? Sending up to Herod Antipas, you know, why'd you marry your brother's wife? And this is not a good idea. So he got thrown in prison. So that happens a little later, but Mark moves him out of the way immediately and says, okay, so after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news of God, All right? Again, gospel not as a kind of book, but as good news, what it really is. Euganglion in Greek. Preaching the good news of God. And here it is. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus has a strong sense of time. Throughout his ministry. Uh, he, uh, John, when you get into John's gospel, John talks about his hour. You know, they, they wanted to seize him, but they couldn't lay hands on him because it wasn't his hour yet. And, and Jesus seems to know that. He, he's, and he, he knows that, you know, that as he, as he completely and fully obeys his father in everything, that nothing's going to happen until his father says okay. And so he's able to confidently maneuver in certain situations. He's also able, as we'll see next time, he does something nobody I've ever seen in ministry do. He, he's very popular. He's got people coming to him all over the place. And he says to his disciples, we need to move on because I was sent to do other stuff. I've never seen anyone leave a prosperous ministry. Never. But Jesus does because he has that sense of timing. We, we, we've got other things to do. Let's, let's leave and, and go somewhere else. Uh, and so Jesus has this sense of timing. And the time is present now. It's fulfilled. What's fulfilled? What God promised in the Old Testament is fulfilled. The visitation has come. The kingdom of God is near or is at hand. In other words, it's, it's imminent. It's right here. This is an invitation that he puts, a positive invitation that he puts before everyone who listens to him. Do you want to be in the kingdom? Then get ready. Here it comes. And then what does he say immediately after that? Well, how, how then do you enter the kingdom? Repent and believe the good news. Now, we'll see more of what that good news is as we go through Mark's gospel. But again, notice the similarity between Jesus and John, what they're talking about. Repent. Everybody's got to repent. And for the, for the same reason the religious leaders did not like John, they're not going to like Jesus. Because he doesn't play by their rules. He listens to another voice. He listens to a higher authority. And he demonstrates that higher authority. In a way that frankly is an embarrassment to the religious leaders of his time. And that is the genesis of the conflict and why it continues to build throughout the gospel. Did you have a question? Yeah, well, the kingdom here. Is he talking about, is he thinking... We know, I know he knows everything, and he knew he had to die. But is he talking about the kingdom? If the Jews really accepted him as the Messiah, the kingdom come? Or what is he talking about? Well, that's, now, that's an excellent question. What is Jesus talking about when he talks about the kingdom of God? Now, you talked about, as he's talking to the Jews, would, would this be it? And the answer to that is no, because that creates the great problem around Jesus as the Christ, of course is because he does not bring them the kingdom they expect, which is what? Which is an earthly political kingdom with them in the, in the driver's seat. And Jesus did not come to bring that kingdom. 
And a lot of what he is going to have to, to uh, teach his disciples as he goes through this gospel, you'll see, is that you, know, you don't know what the kingdom is. You need to put aside all your preconceptions. You don't know what the kingdom is. You don't know who the Messiah is. You, you think you know these things, but you don't. There's a lot they have to unlearn. And that is why, as we'll see here in Mark's gospel, it's also the same way in Matthew, what happens right after Peter confesses who Jesus is? And it's, it's right at that moment. What, what's the very next thing Jesus starts to teach them immediately? That he had to die. That's right. As soon as they get it, you are the Christ. He's like, that's right. Now let me tell you, I have to go up to Jerusalem and die. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, if you're the Christ, what? They, and then he has to teach them why and what that's about. And of course, it's something they don't want to hear. And it's something that they never really fully grasp because they don't want to grasp it. He even tells them that in Luke's gospel the night before he goes to the cross. And they still don't want to hear it. It's only after he's crucified that they reckon with that and that he did talk about this. And we, we didn't understand. And it was, but here, here's how it all fits together. But again, there's a sense of, so when Jesus is the kingdom, he's going to have to show them what the kingdom is, which is why Jesus often speaks in what? Parables, okay? Which start off what? How do the parable, many of the parables begin? The parables are usually about the kingdom of God. And they start off with this phrase, the kingdom of God is like. Because now, now, you don't need to tell people those if they know what the kingdom is. You tell parables about the kingdom of people who don't know the kingdom. But Jesus tells those parables to the Jews as well as the Gentiles. Now, let me, let me explain to you the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is light. And we'll see a few of those parables. Not as many as in Luke's gospel. But there are a few here in Mark's gospel. So, Jesus begins this process. After John's taken into custody, he begins preaching the good news of God. Time is now. The kingdom's near. So take that first step. Repent. Believe the good news. And that is just the beginning. That's not the end. That's the beginning of the journey of those who will follow Jesus. And so I'm going to stop there. And next week, when we pick it up again, guess what Jesus is going to start doing? He's going to call his disciples, those who are going to follow him. So those who take that first step, then they get to take another one. And that's how it works. You take one step, and then God shows you what the next step is. And uh, so it will be here, and we'll see that next time. So any, any other questions on the first 15 verses? Yes. I was wondering in verse 11 why it just says able. Why doesn't it say God? Well, because there is a sense in which there, you do get, uh, in the Old Testament, times of God directly speaking, although what happens often? Some, some people do that, just like when, when it happens later on, you know, I think that's in John's Gospel, glorify, Father, glorify your name, and it says, I glorified it, and will glorify it again. It said, and some people, what, thought it had thundered, you know, they, they didn't hear the voice, but Jesus heard the voice. And, and the voice is, you know, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. That will be unpacked later on, and it will become clear as you read the gospel what it means to be the son of God and what that, what that all looks like. I, I don't think Mark puts that in, in front because I think he doesn't want to give that necessarily yet. I mean, you could guess that, but to have that confirmed, you've got to read the verse of the book. To see what that means. And I think it's very deliberate on his part that he doesn't do that. All right. Any other questions? All right. Let's pray then. Lord, thank you today. We've made a beginning. We've made a beginning in this good news that Mark brings us. And we pray, Lord, that that beginning will continue. As we learn what it is to be a repentant people. As we learn what it is to believe in you. To trust you. Lead us. In your path, we pray. And we thank you that you are the God who is with us. You are with us when times are wonderful and easy, and you're with us when we're out in the wilderness and among the wild animals. 
Give us that confidence, Lord. Help us to walk with you each day, each moment. And we thank you that you have been with us today in our time together. We're grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And for those of you watching at home, we'll see you next week.